Welcome to the IP Communications and VoIP community. We're at VUC.me on the web. Our weekly conferences began in 2007. And we would like to thank for their support Simwood.com. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco with their world class API. Check that out, Simwood.com. Our host at PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can actually get a clickable link free for people to call you browser to browser at GetOnSIP.com. The website is hosted at Bluehost.com. And where would we be without ZipDX.com, the full-featured HG Voice Conference Bridge? And finally, local rate dial-ins from Voxbone.com. Thanks to everyone who makes this thing possible, especially the participants. And this whole .com thing makes things sound like uh, there's a .com balloon happening. I'm having trouble changing my camera. I'm terribly sorry to tell you. We've had a little problem with the the um, Google plugin, interestingly enough. But hey, so you can't see me, big deal. This is VUC 484. It's April 11th. We have a terrific guest. I'm really honored to welcome Alex. Alex E., who is going to pronounce his name and tell us how it needs to be pronounced. Thank you, Alex, in advance. He's muted. Thank you guys for, for inviting me. So the correct pronunciation is Eleftheriadis. I'm sure we all got that now. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, I want to introduce, uh, just say hello to Emil, who's also with us. Emil Ivov. Hey, Alex. Hey, all. Hi, good. And of course, we made a big thing because it took a long time to get this organized. Uh, Bernard Abab was going to be with us, and he unfortunately cannot. We'll reschedule, but it takes weeks and weeks to get these two gentlemen together at, on one screen. Either that, or it's like Superman and Clark Kent. Alex is really Bernard, you know, with a different different clothes. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Alex, I'd love to have you introduce yourself. Everybody knows Emil here, so he doesn't need any introduction. James Bodie's with us from Truefone. Uh, Peter Dunkley's here from. Um, Whatever the name of the guy. Sorry. Oxygen. Thank you. Michael Graves is handling the audio bridge to ZipDX. Alex, um, if you don't mind, there's one question you maybe haven't answered much, and that is, how did you get started in technology? It's a question I like to ask people. Huh, interesting. Okay. Uh, in fact, my, my father was a mechanical engineer. He was trained at the University of Munich, you know, right after the Second World War. So I grew up in a sort of engineering family. My, my sister is actually Austin Engineering. She's a professor of uh, civil engineering in Florida. Uh, I have a twin brother who is in law, actually. So he's, uh, he's in Oxford, actually. And he, he specializes in constitutional law and philosophy law. So, so, you know, I think it was sort of running in the family. And then uh, at some point, I was thinking of between music, physics, and electrical engineering. And, uh, you know, uh, the third choice was, was it what it was. But uh, initially, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure exactly what it was all about. And after I got into the university, actually, I realized how much fun uh, it was. In fact, it took me a couple of years to really understand what it was. So but I, I'm thrilled, actually, that I was actually studying and uh, being an actively active professional during the time that I was. I finished my undergrad in 1990 in, uh, in Athens. What I'm actually calling you today, I mean, Athens, Greece, right now. And uh, I went to Columbia University for my PhD, and I finished in '95. And in fact, I stayed there until uh, 2005 when we started video. Um, so that's kind of like a brief, uh, very brief history of, of, of my involvement with uh, electrical engineering. That's perfect. And now uh, our topic today is going to be video. Can you give us a little bit about the video involvement? How did that come to be? And, and you're somebody that, let's face it, you're a pretty important guy in, in this space. So how did, uh, what, what are the early days of that? Hey, look, I, 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 well, I did my PhD at Columbia. And for people who don't know, Columbia is uh, the only university who was a founding member of the MPEG LA. In other words, my advisor at the time had one of the patents that were essential for MPEG-2 video, which is the 
technology used in, in DVDs. So there was a there was a, a, a lot of know-how in applied research in video compression at Columbia when I was a student. In fact, Feng Ming Wang, who went on to, to C-Tube uh, Microsystems, you know, was a student in the same group. It was like a period of immense, you know, I think activity at Columbia uh, at the time. So even before video, I was heavily involved in video communications. We had prototype systems for, for like with motion JPEG on an Ethernet LAN using, you know, uh, raw audio on a sound workstation and using motion JPEG from parallax boards. These were boards made in a, from parallax graphics. It was a company in, in California. We're talking about 92, 93 now. This was before the web. For, for those who actually remember those, those days. So, so, so I was in that speed for many years. And so when the time came and I met the co-founder of video, Ofer Sapiro, who actually came and found me at Colombia, you know, it was very clear to us what we needed to do. And in fact, I'm going to explain it today, what we need to do, in, uh, which is, you know, it's the subject sort of of my topic. But that's how video got started. You know, Ofer had several years working for Radvision out of Israel and then out of uh, United States. So we combined forces and, and sort of, you know, uh, created, uh, initially the company was called Layered Media, LMI, and then, you know, it was renamed uh, Video. Usually the first job that the marketing executive does when he joins a company is, is <laughs> change the name. In this instance, I think it was quite uh, the right thing to do. Um, we should, I think it's worth saying, uh, in case anybody doesn't realize this, that video with a Y, is the technology being licensed by a lot of the things we see, including what we're talking on right now, Google Hangouts, as far as I know. That's correct. That is correct, yes. So yeah, all the, you know, the, the, the design, the technology behind this is videos. Uh, implementation details are Google's, including the signaling details and blah, blah, but the core technology is, uh, is videos. And what is the, this might be a dumb question, but I think a lot of people might be wondering what the core, te what you mean by core technology? Uh, this will be exactly the subject of my talk. So let me not not uh, not give away the plot. Okay. Okay. Let's leave the who done it for the end. Uh, but that's exactly what I want to talk about because I think and you know and I'm actually very happy to to be able to be here today and present to you because you know I think it's very important for people to take stock you know after like several years and and observe the technical developments and sort of figure out okay where are we and where are we going. So that's that's kind of like the, the subject of my talk. Um, Okay, that's perfect. Does anybody have any general questions for Alex before we continue? And Emil, of course, you're one of the guests, uh, so if you have any comments as well, welcome to. Otherwise, we'll let Alex get his started with his presentation. I had one quick, very general question. What's the symbolic behind the video name? Why, why the why? And uh, does it mean anything? Is it just a, a game of words or? It is a game. It is a game of words, uh, and I think uh, for, for, you know it was very difficult for people to pick up company names that were short and relevant. And at the time, and we're talking about maybe I don't know 2007 or something. I think it was sort of like a trend to use names that were close enough to what the company did, but not quite, you know, uh, right on. So, so they would, you know, people would change one letter to sort of make it uh, similar. So, you know, that was, I think that was a choice. Um, um, and again, you know, all, as always with these cases, when we have changes and names and what have you, you know, some people are in favor, some against. You know, in the end of the day, uh, the name gets substance when you know what's behind it, right? Uh, 20 years ago, the word Google would, would mean nothing, absolutely nothing to, right, to, to, to all people. But now, uh, it's so associated with what's behind it that you cannot disassociate the two. So, so hopefully video is accomplishing the same thing, obviously not at the Google magnitude, but I mean, the, the, the process is building an identity behind the name. So, yeah, that's kind of like the, the, the history. All right, uh, thank you. Sure. So in fact, this, this, uh, this talk, by the way, this, this uh, happening today is an outgrowth of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a serendipitous meeting of Emil, myself, and Bernard at another meeting in Chicago. And uh, so I will be reprising a lot of those the discussions we had at the time with Emil and Bernard, and it's unfortunate Bernard is not around. I'll try to do my best to represent his also uh, if, you know, point of view and remarks um, uh, as much as I can. Um, but that was like the, you know, that's how I personally got to know Emil personally. It was 
again, a very serendipitous occasion. Really pre I really appreciate that Emil thought of this thing and that and then you guys agreed to do it. And it's really I'm really sorry that Bernard uh, is not able to do it. Uh, Alex, why don't you go ahead with your presentation then, if there's no further questions, and we'll uh, we'll take it from there. Sounds good. So let me share my window. So, so the subject of the talk is the future of video. And I have a subtitle, even though I hate subtitles, which are always now present in books, but I hate them. But the reason I put it is because my original uh, theme for, for a talk like, like this one is the death of the MCU. And, uh, 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 and the two, actually, the, the future of video and the death of the MCU, in my mind, are heavily intertwined. And hopefully, in the next half hour or so, I will be able to to convince you. Okay, so you know, so we all know what death is, and we hopefully will not encounter it anytime soon. Uh, a better name might actually be extinction. In other words, uh, the MCU as a species, as a way to solve a particular technical problem, I think has reached probably the end of its useful uh, uh, time, at least for 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 large deployments. By the way, is everybody getting the slides? Just to make sure you are, right? Yeah, yeah it's perfect. Okay. Yeah. So actually, I did some some investigation for multi-point video conferencing, right? Because MCU is multi-point conferencing unit. So the earliest reference I could find was on 1987 on a paper that I have actually not been able to get a copy of. The the actual earliest paper I could find in IEEE Explore, which is a online database from uh, from IEEE. It's a paper by, by Clark discussing multi-point multimedia conferencing, and she describes the work that was done in a project, in a European project actually at the time, which had multi-point uh, using video switching. So it was voice-activated video switching using H.261, and that was back in '92. Uh, from commercial fossils for the extinct species of MCU. The earliest I was able to find, in fact, not necessarily online, Steve Botsko from Polycom helped me because I thought originally that Polycom had the earliest product. It is not true. A company called Video Server, which was founded in 91, did its IPO 95, and released a, a product called Multimedia Conference Server, which had a feature called Continuous Presence. And it used a video processing unit, which was a add-on in hardware, so you'd add a, a board on a backplane, and it could support 8, 16, or 48 endpoints uh, on the same machine. It, and actually, it even allowed cascading. This, by the way, this was in April 96. That was before H.323 was uh, ratified, okay? So we are talking about, you know, way before the onset of, you know, IT-based um, uh, uh, video conferencing, okay? So that's the earliest example I could find. Now, this architecture is with us today, in fact, very much so. So, so let me briefly uh, summarize the types of MCUs that people use today. Uh, uh, and first of all, as a way to depict video streams, I'm going to be using these uh, horizontal strips. In this instance, I have two, two of those, A and B, depicting two independent streams. And this little picture that I have on the stream means it's a video stream, okay? Just so we have something visual to, to see, okay? Um, so uh, the, the simplest architecture for an MCU is a so-called switching MCU. So you have incoming streams from the left, A, B, C, and D, right? They are compressed, they are MCU, and uh, uh, the MCU will uh, select one of them to forward to the right to the receiving participants. In this instance, screen B was selected. And typically, the, the, the criterion with which the selection is made is voice activity. So the active speaker uh, gets to be the one shown on everybody's, uh, everybody's screens. Now, this, is, this doesn't require any significant processing because it's just forwarding the stream that we receive. Uh, there is audio, audio uh, mixing, typically, okay? But there's no signal processing for the video signal. But of course, everybody has to agree on the format for the video signal, the bit rates, and all the different details. Because you know, you might be switched in and out on any endpoint at any time. So everybody has to be able to receive it at the, at the, you know, at the same bit rate and same quality. Uh, the, the next generation was uh, the so-called mixing MCU. And in this instance, we have four streams, in this example, coming in from the left. 
typically they come in as low resolution, like QCIF. The, the NCU will combine those QCIF images into a bigger picture. In this instance, it will be a CIF size image. And using tools available from the coding format, for example, the H.261, without much signal processing, you could combine them into a composite image. So again, without having to decode and re-encode the, the data, OK? Uh, again, uh, you'll be sort of constrained about the bit rates and, uh, and uh, screen sizes and what have you. Uh, but again, with this design, you wouldn't have to, to do much signal processing. Um, but you know, the fact that, that everybody has to come in with the same bit rate, same equipment, was very limiting. Uh, so uh, as soon as people were able to do more processing, the transcoding MCU uh, came to be, and that's actually the, the, the dominant architecture used uh, uh, today. And in this instance, what happens is that the server, the MCU, receives code streams from, in this instance, four participants, A, B, C, D. They don't have to be all at the same rate. They don't have to be all at the same resolution. The MCU will decode everything, recompose the picture, okay, and then re-encode the resultant picture and transmit it to the receiving participant. And this way, you can actually have a fully customized layout for every participant. Of course, for that, you will have to be willing to do a separate encoding of, of a composite picture for each of the participants. As a result, the transcoding MCU has to have tremendous amount of computational power, because it has to do multiple decodes for all incoming streams, and then it has to do the composition. Right? So you have to resize and position on a, on a frame buffer and then re-encode the resulting image. And again, if you want to have uh, a personalized layout where each participant selects the layout that they're going to see the participants in, then the MCU has to do a separate encoding, separate composition and separate encoding for each participant. So you can see then that, that, that the MCU, the transcoding MCU, is actually a very uh, uh, but uh, the worst is not the complexity in computation. The worst is that it introduces tremendous delay. In other words, all this processing that will happen on the MCU will take a lot of time. And you know, port to port, input to output delays of 180 milliseconds are typical in a transporting MCU. Now, imagine that for, for, for interactive communication, your end-to-end has to be in that range, 180 to 200 milliseconds. So if you give away 180 to 200 just on the server, and then you start adding transmission delays, encoding delays on the endpoint, on transmitting endpoint, or decoding delay on the receiving endpoint, you are quickly you know, beyond 300 milliseconds. And that's why with a transcoding MCU, you never have a clean multi-point interactive experience. The delay is so high that, that it immediately gets in the way, okay? So, so technology is not transparent, and by it not being transparent, it is annoying. And that's why people, uh, you know, they don't feel happy when they participate in such conferences for a long time, because you cannot participate as you would normally participate in a, in a, in a live conference, okay? So delay is a key issue here. It's a key issue because, again, we need low delay to feel comfortable in, a, in, a, in an interaction. Uh, of course, the cascaded encoding and decoding also uh, uh, de uh, decreases the video quality. The, the more encodings and decodings you have, the worse the quality is going to be. So that's also, uh, that's also actually a very negative uh, uh, thing. Uh, so high delay, transcoding loss, and of course, as I said, complexity and cost are big problems with MCU. Uh, now, the, the MCU, the transcoding MCU, is reflected in the ITF canon, you know, the gospel of all things internet, uh, and in RFC 5117, uh, done in January 2008, it is reflected from the uh, from the point to multi point using RTCP terminating MCU. It's so it has a specific name in the RTP topologies uh, RFC, okay, that define you know the canonical ways where RTP systems are supposed to interact with each other. Okay, so people understand it, it's well understood, documented, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, that, that's how things were until about 2008, uh, in fact 2005, when video was started, but video introduced its first product in 2008. 
And what video did is, is introduce scalable video coding into the mix. Uh, so we actually participated from 2005 onwards in the development of scalable video coding uh, because we wanted to use it in our, in our product lines. Okay? So for, for a lot of people, actually, video is known as the scalable video coding sort of company. But, uh, but again, scalable video coding is one tool, a very necessary tool, for what we are constructing in architecture. So let's see what scalable video coding is all about. In this picture, I'm showing you a set of frames uh, as a sequence you know, over time. So going from left to right, you have succession of distinct frames in a video, in a video sequence. To keep it simple, I'm not going to show uh, content. I'm just going to show empty boxes. So these empty boxes correspond to successive frames of a video sequence. In traditional single layer coding, as it's yours, what what's, has been used for many, many years since the beginning of uh, digital video uh, conferencing, um, the video frames are coded in a chain. So you code the first picture as as uh, 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 independently as a as an sorry as an intra picture, uh, and then each successive picture is coded with reference to the previous one. So you utilize uh, uh, temporal uh, redundancy to uh, to to minimize the amount of data that you need to transmit for each frame, and you use motion compensated prediction and and all sorts of different tools to make that you know quite effective. And that's a technique that has been used. It is used all the time in all video conferencing. Okay, the specific uh, aspect that is of interest to us is that in in in. Uh, in uh, interactive communications in video conferencing, you have this simple, simple chain that starts from the first frame and then sort of never ending. Okay. Now notice that if you miss one of the pictures here, uh, then the whole chain collapses. Right. You can no longer keep decoding because each frame depends on the previous one. The arrows point uh, to the to the frame uh, that predicts from the frame where the arrow is, is coming from. So that's a problem, and that's a problem because if you have a secure channel like an ISDN link that doesn't have a lot of losses, that works fine. And as as long as video conferencing was working on ISDN channel, things were you know fairly okay. But as soon as you switch over to an IP infrastructure, where obviously packet loss is a you know is a is a consistent occurrence, uh, this is a problem because this cannot tolerate any loss. Uh, and in fact, systems that utilize this type of coding have significant problems. With any sort of packet loss above two three percent, okay. Now, with, with temporally scalable coding, this is the first instance of scalable coding. What you do is the following: first, you pick in this example uh, uh, one frame out of uh, four. So, in this instance, I picked one out of four and I put a red circle around it. Okay, uh, this will be our layer zero, T zero. Now, what we do is we call those pictures as we use for single layer. So it's a single chain, right, that starts somewhere and sort of never ends, okay? Uh, but that only covers one-fourth of the pictures, right? So what you do next is you add the second layer, layer one, where the prediction of these new pictures is done based on the, on the most, recent, uh, most recent layer zero picture. So in this instance, I put a T1 picture in the middle, right? And that depends on the immediately previous T0, okay? Uh, notice that Notice that, that if you lose the T1 picture, uh, will that affect the second T0 picture? No, because the T0 does not depend on the T1. The T0 will depend on the previous T0. So if you lose the T1, that's not a problem. You lose it, you won't be able to show it, but it won't affect the chain. Okay? So already, by this scheme, you gain something because this is more reliable. right? Only if you lose half of the packets, you have a problem. If you lose the other half, the T1s, is not a big problem. Okay? And you can do that as a third layer in this particular example, where you add this layer two, the two pictures, where again the prediction is done from the nearest layer one or layer zero picture. And what I show here is called hierarchical P picture coding, because this creates a hierarchy of, of, of uh, temporal resolutions. You start from T0, that is seven and a half frames per second. If you add the T1, that's another seven and a half, so you go to 15. And the T2 pictures add yet another layer, which is um, another 15 frames per second. Okay. Now, something that people uh, uh, observe is, okay, wait a second, wouldn't that hurt coding efficiency because the T0s are further apart? In actual fact, it has been shown that this, this is even beneficial for coding efficiency if you do the assignment of the bits correctly, meaning you spend more bits on the T0 
this, on the T0 pixels and less bits on the T1 and the T2. Uh, so in fact, if, you know, it's sort of counterintuitive, but, but, but it has been shown that it's actually beneficial. But there is a bigger, much bigger benefit that is not immediately obvious. Remember when I tell you about the chain, that if it's broken, right, you have catastrophic effect on the video, okay? And there's nothing you can do because the temporal distance between successive frames is 33 milliseconds, right, for a 30, 30 frame per second sequence. But look at this picture here. The chain that should not be broken involves only the T0 pixels. Now, these T0 pixels are not 33 milliseconds apart. They are actually four times that apart. And guess what? If something happens, right, in my stream, I don't have just 33 milliseconds to react. Now I have four times that, right? So I have 120 plus. This means that I have plenty of time for the current time scale of events, you know, on a regular network to react to that. As soon as the receiver realizes, oops, I missed something, I missed the zero picture, they can actually, you know, start with the send an act and ask the sender to, to retransmit the missing information. If that information is arrives on time for the next T0 picture, I don't care about the T1 and the T2 because, you know, they're not part of the chain. If I get on time for the T0, boom, I'm able to continue decoding as if nothing happened. Somebody, in other words, that arrives at the time of the second T0 picture, right, they will not even know that there was an error. Okay? So that's a key feature of temporal scalability. And this, this, this technique I just described to you is essential, you know, for scalable video coding. And in fact, now it has been understood by everybody. Uh, we have introduced it in, uh, in a lot of payload formats, not just for SVC in the ITF, but it's now part of other codecs, including VP8 and including HEVC. I'll say more about it in, uh, in a second. But that's a key trick for error resilience that was not possible before scalable video coding because you need this temporal distance of the pictures to add reliability, okay? Uh, so that's for temporal scalability. There is also spatial scalability, which is something that video uh, is using. And in this instance, you use, in the same B stream, you have two pieces of information. One for a low resolution version of the signal and one for a high resolution version of the signal. The, the reason why you do that is that because uh, uh, depending on what you do on the receiving end, you could use either a small resolution to show it on the screen, right? If you don't see some, if you don't show somebody in high resolution, so you would only get the small, the smaller uh, picture. But you can also use it for for error resilience purposes. In other words, if I miss packets from the full resolution picture, I can actually use information from the low resolution data for for concealment. So it helps in in both ways. It also helps in, in, in bitrate adaptation, so that if, if you know, different people join a session with different bitrate capabilities, that you can actually uh, adapt. Now, if you combine the two, spatial and temporal scalability, you get something like this picture, okay? That, that shows three temporal layers with two spatial layers. Now, admittedly, it's kind of complicated, so let's keep it simple for the sake of our discussion. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be showing single layer video as a single strip, like A here in this uh, picture. And I'm going to be showing scalable video as a set of layers. For the sake of example, I'm just going to put two layers, base and enhancement, right, for two spatial layers. And presumably there is temporal resolution. is not shown on the diagram. But the idea is that the, 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 the scalable version that has these two strips includes both spatial and temporal scalability. Okay? So... That's, that's, what, that's what scalable video coding is. Now, let's see, uh, oh, uh, uh, we'll see what it does in a second, but, but uh, to, to summarize the pros and cons. First of all, there is some overhead in compression. In other words, you spend a little bit more bits than single layer, but, so it's about 15 to 20%, but you get superb error resilience. You can actually tolerate more than 20% packet loss rates in burst mode which is, by the way, the typical testing conditions for, you know, companies like Skype and so on. So, so without it, you just cannot do it. One reason why, you know, we guys now don't see breakups in the video signal that we are experiencing right now between ourselves is exactly this technique, all right? Uh, and the extra penalty that you pay, by the way, uh, the best example I have uh, for this is, is four-wheel drive. Four-wheel drive spends more fuel than, than if you don't have it, right? So it's more expensive consumption-wise. But obviously, if you're on an icy road, right, you save the car and yourself. 
So you pay a little bit of a premium in terms of you know higher consumption, but you know you save all the hospital or whatever you know funeral expenses. Uh, so so uh, it's the same with scalability. If you try to do error resilience without scalability, by the way, and use forward error correction, etc., you'll be paying much more. Not only that, you'll be paying it all the time because FEC works when you transmit the data, even if you have an error and when you don't. The beauty with scalable video recording and the technique I just described to you is that you only have an overhead, an error resilience overhead, truly, if you have an error. If you don't have an error, you only have this 15%. So it's actually quite economic. So now, so that's what SVC is. Let's see what SVC does. What does it enable? What it enables is a new type of server, which at video we call the video router, okay, which works in the following way. It receives scalably coded streams from the endpoints from the left. So in this instance, I'm showing A, B, and C from the left as transmitting three different scalable streams, right? They go to the video router, and what the video router does, it will select which packets, which layers to forward from which participant to the receiving endpoint. So if you don't want to see somebody, the router will not send you the video data for that participant. If you see that participant in low resolution, it will only send you the small, you know, the base layer. If you want to see that person in full resolution, like I'm, like I'm watching right now, Michael Graves, okay, you'll get the high resolution uh, picture because you know it will be useful to see it in high quality. So these are decisions that the video router is making without, however, processing the data. There is no decoding. There is no re-encoding. It just gets packets, it terminates RTP connections, it reads, it, it reads the packet header and decides if a particular packet should be forwarded to a particular participant or not. So it does what we call selective forwarding. And it can do that again based on different criteria. It could be based on your layout. It could be because of bitrate concerns. Like if you don't have a very high bitrate connection, the, the video router could elect not to send you high resolution video because you cannot tolerate from the connection that you have. Okay. Now, all these decisions, again, in the transcoding MCU, they would require signal processing, whereas here, it's just, uh, it's just uh, 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 a routing decision. Okay, so what do we gain with this architecture? First of all, we get error resilience from, from scalable coding. The retransmission, I told you, can be done from an endpoint. It can also be done from a router. So if you have a nearby router, a video router, it can do the retransmission for you. So you get immediate recovery. You get rate matching. Okay, because the router will select which layer components to send to you. Okay, you get personalized layout because it's not the router that does the layout. You will receive the video data yourself and you will do the layout as you wish. It's inherently low delay because in a sense it's like it's in the order of 15 to 20 milliseconds. Because again, you open the packet, you read it, and you forward it. There's no signal processing involved. Uh, you do error localization because if you have an error prone connection, that will involve the transmission only between the, pa the parts that are the beginning and end uh, of the problematic path. Everybody else who is uh, happily, you know, good networks, they don't need to do retransmission, they don't need to experience intra pictures, they, they live happily without caring about the problems that you may be having with your connection. It's infinitely low complexity, again, no, no signal processing whatsoever, and you get cascading in a reasonable way because, again, with 15 to 20 millisecond delay, it's easy to add two or three video routers in a, in a cascade in the path from one participant to another. So you can easily have administrative, you know, uh, partitions, you know, different companies, different campuses, different continents, and so on and so forth, okay? If you compare uh, a video router in a traditional MCU and you try to capture 600 high definition connections, an and, and analysis that was done you know, a few years back, it, it was six, a 6U six system for video router and a 114U system, you know, rack units, right, for a trans tra traditional MCU, okay? Uh, it's a tremendous difference. We can do from a single one uh, uh, rack unit, you know, more than 100 HD uh, connections. Uh, now, there is, a, there is more. And the... the the, the beauty of it is what happens on the endpoint. Now, the endpoint has to be different. Why? First, it has to be able to do multi-stream. It has to receive multiple video streams, one for each participant, and it will have to do decoding, composition, okay, and rendering on its own. Okay. The beauty 
with that is that you get to do personal layout uh, without having to talk to anybody. I mean, it's your own rendering and your own composition, so so it's completely in your own uh, disposal. Okay, uh, and it doesn't burden anybody else. Uh, a very good parallel to that model is the web browser. Think of it this way: the web browser. What does it do? In its, with, uh, ignoring scripting, it you make a request for content, and it will just send you the content, right? The browser will get the content, decode, and render. That allows the web server to be a very low complexity device, so that it can support thousands, tens of thousands of users at the same time. Imagine the web. If the web server had to pre-render your pictures, your 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 web pages, and send you uh, already rendered uh, images, a, a web server would not be able to support more than a hundred users, right? So you would never be able to scale the web at the numbers that we have today because the web server would be a very expensive piece of hardware. If you divided the number of users, you know that the, you know the, 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 the cost per user of the web server would be enormous. By pushing the complexity to the endpoints, you allow the server to be very cheap, and you capitalize on the available computational power of your endpoint, right? So that's what this does for video conferencing. It pushes the complexity from the server to the endpoint. The endpoint does the decoding, it does the, the composition and the rendering, so it behaves as a web browser does. And, and I think that's a key distinction, right? Which is, if the, it's the key in my mind that unlocks the ability to do video in a grand scale. I'm talking about millions of users, okay? Uh, so, uh, and that's facilitated by, by scalable video calling. Now, one way to do a similar thing is to use simulcasting. What is simulcasting? In the upper part of this picture, I'm showing you the, the scalable video coded uh, uh, video which has the two strips connected to each other, meaning the enhancement A depends on base A. To decode the enhancement A, you need to receive base A. In other words, you cannot decode the enhancement without the base, uh, because SVC, scalable video coding, is pyramidal. Okay? So you need the lower layers to decode the higher layers. An alternative is to use uh, simulcasting, where you transmit two separately encoded streams. So in this instance, the low resolution and the high resolution are two separate encodings. Uh, now, this has a, is attractive. Why? The other part, the scalable video coding part, is today is Annex G of H.264. So it's a scalable video coding extension of H.264. In the bottom picture, what you could do is use vanilla H.264. In other words, not use the scalable extension and have two streams that provide two different resolutions. Okay. Again, there's no dependency between the two. What you can do then is you can try to mimic the operation of the video router with what I call here a simulcast edition, where the endpoints transmit simulcast streams, meaning every endpoint transmits two streams now, a low resolution and a high resolution. And the, and the server in the middle will decide which one to forward to the receiving participant. Now, this has a number of problems. One of the a key one being that it has a lot of overhead because the endpoints have to transmit two streams. Uh, for that, for the for the simulcast, you will need to spend 50% more bits compared with a single resolution video. I, I, to recall, for, with SVC, you would spend 15 to 20% uh, uh, overhead. So with simulcast, uh, you'll go all the way up to 50. Uh, uh, but then you do get multiple uh, streams on the server, and then the server can actually work by doing this selective forwarding operation to the endpoint. Uh, uh, for me, it's funny to recall back in 2008, 2009, when we first, you know, were presenting this, people had an issue with a 15 to 20 percent overhead of SVC compared with uh, uh, single-layer coding. And to me, it's very funny to see that uh, five years, you know, six years later. People are now willing to spend not just the 15, 20%, they are willing to spend 5, 0, 50% more to get to the benefits. Okay? Uh, now, so you get the selective forwarding function, you don't get all the error resilience because, again, the streams are not interconnected and there are a lot of you know, details like that. But again, it's a way to approach the functionality. Uh, so that's completely new. It was not foreseen 
by the standards of the ITF. And, and in fact, you know, there was this right now, there is, a, there is in process a revision of the RTP topology uh, standards. And in fact, a, a, a colleague of mine, Stefan Wenger from Video, works with Marcus Westerlund from Ericsson in a revision of, of the RTP topology draft. And uh, they use the term media projecting middle box, uh, which I think, you know, might be good for technical folks, but I think it doesn't say much to, to a lay person out there. So I propose in October 2013 to call this operation, either simulcast or scale of video calling, it doesn't matter, to call this the selective forwarding unit or SFU. Now, thankfully, Magnus and Stefan agreed. And so now in the RTP topologies update, which is now uh, it's a workbook draft, it's incorporated. So if you go to that draft, uh, uh, you can actually see it being described. Okay. Uh, now, that's important because, again, if it's not reflected in the standards, there are no standards for this to work. And a key issue with scalable video coding and the video router and so on that people have is, okay, how do you interoperate, right? How do you connect to that beast and, and what, what protocols are you going to use to control all these things? Unfortunately, unfortunately, because of the novelty of this, the standards are not there yet. So the first step, in my mind, is to, first of all, realize that these architectures exist, that they are useful. You give them a name. So in my opinion, this, this SFU thing is very important. We have a name now, and people can start building on that name, all right? Uh, but it will take a while for all these different standards to be in. I'll say more in a, in a few minutes about this. Now, the scalability, scalability is so essential now. I think we opened the, we, 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 we made it very clear to the world that you cannot have interactive video today without at least temporal scalability. As a result, it's not only part of H.264, and again, through the, the work of video and others, it became Annex G. It's also part of VP8, and it's also part of H.265 or HEVC, which is a new standard that has been ratified in January. Uh, it in, it's included in their RTP payload formats, okay? So that trick I described you with the, with the temporal scalability is part of all the RTP payload formats now. And it will be in the scalable version of HCVC, which is coming in July 2014. And of course, it will be part of EP9, which is, uh, you know, is the next generation codec that uh, Google is developing. And as you may have uh, read, that uh, Video and Google are collaborating on a scalable version of of uh, of, uh, of EP9. Now, who is using SVC? Obviously, Video introducing and is using uses it in, in its entire, you know, video router. Uh, video technology portfolio, but but see like that companies that have it either in production or development include Cisco, obviously Google, uh, Polycom, Microsoft in Link 2013, and there are others who use it uh, uh, just a codec, not a server architecture. They use the SVC codec for error resilience. Uh, I think Avaya would be in that uh, in that category. Now, uh, myself and Bernard and others are spending a lot of time in standardization. Okay. And one particular standardization activity where Bernard and I, and I collaborate very uh, actively is the Unified Communications Interoperability Forum, the UCIF. And the UCIF involves a lot of companies from the you know, UC space, and we spend actually two, three years debating standards for all these things to work. And we, we are actually completed what I would call the first generation specification. We have a, a, we have a BISTIM specification which defines the, the video coding bits that go on the wire. We have a final draft, it's about to be published, on the transport, meaning how do you get those bits and you put them on RTP packets? That's what I call the transport. But we realized that we are nowhere close to having an interoperable spec from signaling, okay? Because people do things differently and the ITF standards are not mature enough today to allow us to interoperate. So what we did in UCIF is actually do two things. First of all, we renamed the SVC working group that I was chairing at UCIF. We renamed it Video Working Group because we finished SVC work and we are looking ahead now to HCBS. But the most interesting in my mind activity is one that is now starting and is chaired by Bernard. That group is called MAIN for Media Aware Network Element and, and its focus will be to take the box that is this selective forwarding unit, look at the different protocols that you need to connect to it, and make sure that all the pieces work with each other. 
What we found is in the ITF is because they're following a tools-based approach, you need to talk to like 10 different groups, right, to get a system going, okay, because each group deals with a particular slice of the protocol pie. But for this to work, you really need to have an architected complete picture. So this group, uh, that again is just now starting, will, will look at sort of the next generation of systems and try to, to make things right by identifying what needs to be done to get interoperability. For example, you know, how do you signal that the layer should be added or dropped? That's not a functionality that was foreseen you know, when RTP and STP and all these things were, were done, you know, many, many, many years ago. So we need to fix that, we need to do that in a systematic way. So this is an effort to do, to do, to do exactly that, okay? So, in, in summary, with scalability, uh, we solve fundamental problems in packet video. Again, I was a professor at Columbia University, you know, for 10 years. Uh, error resilience was a key problem, uh, and I think Temporal scalability truly, truly, you know, op opens up a completely new world in terms of, uh, of resilience. Also, low delay, which for multipoint, it's it's just you know, it's it, without it, you just cannot really use it as a working tool. Okay. Now, with SFU architecture, now you make video conferencing similar to any other network-based application. In other words, instead of buying a huge rack of hardware that costs more than an entire IT department's hardware, right? which was the case for traditional transcoding MCUs. They used to run in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay, of course. You buy a single one U device, pretty much the same as it would be for a web server, a database server, you know, exchange server, right? It's the same type of equipment, right? So, so you can easily deploy video conferencing as any other uh, uh, service. So with, those two with, with these two things, I think now we have technically, we have the elements necessary to offer excellent quality to users, so they will truly embrace it in the day-to-day -day, uh, work. And we have a technology that can scale to support millions of users, meaning the cost per user per minute is really so low that you know you can actually uh, use it without really thinking about it, okay? It's, it's, it's truly uh, minimal. So for me, this represents evolution, meaning we now have a different species, so to speak. We have a, an architecture, an organism that works in a completely different way, right? And you see that all the different pieces had to change. It's not just changing the codec. It's not just I have an MCU and I have a room system, I'm just going to throw in SVC and I'm done. No. SVC is a tool that allows you to change both architecture of endpoint, again, multi-stream, a composition at the endpoint, etc., and the architecture of the server. Okay, all these things are 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 changed. So you can imagine, you can take an MC, uh, sorry, you can take a video router and throw it in the cloud. You don't need to own the hardware that runs the video router. Okay, it runs perfectly well in a cloud infrastructure. That's the type of deployment scenarios that you need to be able to support in order to scale to millions of users. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. That's what I was afraid of, because we're going to uh, open it up to questions and comments. That's excellent, Alex, and I know that the people who are capable of following all of that uh, are uh, are ready to ask some questions. There were some questions in IRC, and I would really like to um, get those clarifications. Who was following? James, you were following pretty closely. So, what was the first question that was asked in IRC that that needs an answer? You were you were in that. Except you're muted now. Am I? Am I still yes. mute? You're good. You're good. So you you were up there with the with the best of them. Yeah. No, there's a bit Bob, of a debate. Bob Bull says you had you had me. The MCU is dead. <laughs> yeah, there was a, a debate going on about the, the standards and uh, and the the technology behind it. Um, Alex, can you tell us a bit about the sort of applications that we're going to see H two six five used in? I'm guessing that we're going to see um, things embedded in. Uh, much smaller devices um, and that sort of thing. But do you want to spend about 30 seconds just telling us about uh, applications? Sure. Uh, first of all, people have to be very clear. Hardware is driven not by video conferencing. Hardware is driven by broadcasting. In other words, your phone doesn't have a video chip to do video conferencing. It has a video chip for people to sell movies. 
Uh, so, so the broadcast community, which is sort of like you know the separate from uh, from video conferencing community, technically speaking, uh, dictates what goes on on these uh, chips. So, for sure, the key benefit of Azure 265 is, of course, the efficiency, which is true both for single layer and it will be true for 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 scalable coding. So, for all all the applications where where bandwidth is an issue, they will benefit from from 265. Having said that. To get that gain, right? To get that gain, it seems to get you on a broadcast scenario where your encoder operates offline. You can spend a week to encode the movie. Nobody will complain about that. How much time it took to encode, right? But for video conferencing, you need to do this in real time. So, so it's not so easy to, to transition. So I think I think you know you see a slow transition to 265 as time goes on, as people gain implementation experience and get to do subjective optimization. Of the encoder for real time. Okay. Brilliant. Emil, you're next. Yes, um, and I do. I do have a number of questions. Thank you, Alex, for the presentation. Um, I had several uh, technical ones. Uh, for example, the first one is: Do you know how efficiency changes in terms in terms of load CPU, uh, CPU load, sorry, and bit rate? when you add layers. Uh, so you said it, it, it increases by 20% in general for SVC, but what happens when you add a first layer, then a second layer, then a third layer uh, temporal, in, in temporal scaling? Then what happens when you start adding um, you know, spatial layers, uh, sorry, quality layers? How, how does each next layer, is it proportional or is it like uh, the first one is the big hit and then the others are uh, less and less expensive? Uh, it, it, look, there are, there are a lot of different ways of implementing a scalable encoder, and in fact, oftentimes, oftentimes, uh, people do scalable designs even for single-layer codecs. For example, for motion estimation, which is one of the most complicated operations that an encoder would do, right? One of the one of the ways to do it in an accelerated way is to do it on a reduced resolution of the picture and then do progressive refinements. Well, if you do that, it's like computing motion vectors for a scalable video coding. It's the same thing. So, so in fact, uh, I would argue that uh, with SBC, you can better adapt to computational uh, variations because if you, if you run out of time, you could forego the refinement step. You see, you do the coarse, let's say, computation, and if you run out of time, you forego the refinement. Uh, whereas if you don't do it hierarchically, right, you start from, a, you know, from zero, and until you reduce number 10, you run out of time. Well, that might leave you like the last three blocks not coded. Okay, that's disaster. Whereas if you do a, I code everything in a coarse way and then do a refinement. Well, if you run out of time, at least you have everybody in a coarse way. So, so, so when when adaptability is an issue, scalability typically is actually is not a problem. It's the answer, in fact, both for bitrate and for CPU. Okay. No, I, I was actually wondering. Let's say that you have you're sending two layers. Okay, you're sending uh -huh. a low quality layer and. Um, and a high quality layer. And then you're thinking, oh, I have this use case here. I have a middle in my layout. I have a place for showing a, like a mid-sized picture. Uh, and I'm wondering, should I be adding a third layer? How much, how much more expensive is going to be that third layer? How much is it going to complicate things? Uh, mm, okay, it depends on the relative resolution ratios. Usually, if, they, if, look, if they are too close, there is a lot of overhead. If they are too far apart, there is overhead, meaning you know, if, 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 a, if a, a very small base layer doesn't add much for predicting the high resolution picture because they're so different in size that it does. So typically, you progress with ratios of two to one or one and a half to one, okay, at, at most, okay. The, the 1080 to 720p is an example for the one and a half uh, uh, ratio. And if you need to, to show it in a different size on your screen, you add a down sample the full resolution decoded, or you will up sample the low resolution decoded. It depends on you know, you can make you have to make a judgment call on your software. What's the best way to 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 proceed? Okay, uh, yeah. thank you. Um, I have one more in case I'm in case I have other people waiting. I mean, in case there's no one else waiting. Okay. Go ahead. There are a couple. Of pe I'm talking to a couple of people about how they can connect to ask your questions. Go ahead, Emil. Okay, so um, something completely unrelated. Um, are you? I, I don't know all of the video products right now, but um, do you have 
how do you handle how do you handle it when people people come to you and ha and tell you I have this simple video phone here that just handles one video stream and I want to connect it to a, a VYO conference. Um, what do you tell them? Do you do you so, have actually do you have an MCU for them? You, you know, it's an excellent question. What we do is we have a product called Video Gateway. The Video Gateway uh, uh, acts on one hand as an SVC knowledgeable endpoint for for a conference like uh, you know within the SVC let's say uh, environment. And then on the other side, it talks H H.323. It talks SIP. So you can connect any legacy device that we are aware of and we have tested to, a, to an SVC session. So this device is is like a it's like a small MCU in the sense that right. it will actually do the composition for you and it will send you a composited picture. It does, you know, it doesn't have a huge scalability because you know it uses it actually does transcoding, right? But typically what we find guys, and this is interesting, is people want to have this capability because they don't want to feel that they are throwing away their existing hardware. But guess what happens? The experience is so much better on the iPad, on the laptop, on the desktop using scalable coding that what happens is that the gateways are rarely used. People people vote with their feet and they move on to use the better technology because much more convenient. I mean, instead of going to a room system and setting it up and connecting, you know, you send a URL like we did today, for example, right? That's how I connected. I put an email, there was a URL. I clicked, I connected. That's exactly how the video product works. It's exactly the same way. Okay, uh, and you get actually a, a better resolution pictures because we can, you know, we do high definition on uh, on our system. So, uh, so that's, that's as simple as that. Now, how can you beat that, right? I mean, you know, there's nothing that you convince me to go turn to some remote control and start punching them. You know, forget about it. I mean, the, it's, it's gone. So, so it's there again. There are companies, there are use cases. People are tied to these devices. No problem. You get the video gateway and you can connect to them. Okay, thank you. All right, we're looking at a couple of questions here from um, IRC, and one of them uh, may not be f really for you, Alex. I'm not sure, but if you want to comment on it. Um, Jamie Stapleton is asking what makes video... He wants to know the v difference between the video room, this room system, and the... Okay, he says... I'm reading this now. He says, original question may have been worded better. When would I use video room, speakerphone, camera, and screen versus MacBook, Logitech, Conference Cam, CC thirty three thousand E. So basically, the two different systems. If you want to comment on that, that'd be great. Yeah, the, the, the room system. Look, the room system is something you would put on a on a, on a conference room. So you have a table. You put uh, microphones on the table. Two big screens, right? Uh, the traditional video conferencing environment. Uh, which again, a lot of people try want to do that. We, we use that a lot. All our conferences, of course, are equipped with that. It's very convenient, right? Uh, but usually what we do is we control things from my laptop. So I, I'll put up a presentation on the video room uh, 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 screen, right, just by sharing it on the session from my from my laptop. So uh, myself, because I work a lot from my home office here in Athens, Greece, you know, I, I typically use my, I have a you know, nice 27-inch cinema display, I have my laptop, my iPad, that's how I connect. Even though I could have actually a, a, a nice, you know, room system here, I actually don't, I don't use that. I don't, I haven't found use by it. So it's, it's, if you have, if you're a company, you regularly have meetings, it's convenient. Uh, uh, but the software, by the way, is, is, is essentially it's the same engine, the same software. It's just the way you, you use it is different. So, so the rules is you have a PTC camera, you know, wider field of view, again, big screens, uh, more microphones on the table, that kind of stuff. Okay, great. That answers that question. Um, looking, still looking at uh, James. Did you want to ask the uh, what the video way thing was about, or has that been answered? Uh, no, I wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, who owns the IPR for uh -huh. SVC and and how it is licensed. Um, and we know that if you, if you get the licensing wrong or slightly uh, dodgy, it can be uh, a huge barrier to to take up when you roll so, things out. So talk about the uh, the IPR, Alex. Okay, that's that's a very good question. Very good question. So so SVC is in a long line of video codex that where the licensing is extremely well understood. Uh, it's managed. Uh, first of all, it's developing the ITU. Okay, and everybody who participates there has committed to make the patterns necessary to implement the SVC decoders 
available in a reasonable and non-discriminatory way. That doesn't mean free. It means reasonable and non-discriminatory. So uh, the way this works is that a company called MPEG LA, uh, MPEG Licensing Authority, which was formed way back when to manage the MPEG 2 video uh, uh, patents, okay, is managing today the H.264 patent pool. So if you are, uh, if you are manufacturing uh, decoders or encoders that use H.264, either SVC or vanilla, you know, single layer, you need to get a license. Uh, video is both a licensee and a licensor, meaning we have patents in the pool that we give to the pool and we, we allow people to use uh, that patents, and we also pay in the pool because we sell products that use the technology. Now, that's the SVC piece. The codec alone. Obviously, there are other aspects of the architecture that I described, like the video router and what have you. These are also covered by by by, by patterns. Actually, a lot of these things that I mentioned uh, are covered also by videos patterns. Uh, but the SVC piece alone is well understood. Uh, also, for the ITF specifications, uh, when we make submissions of our technology to the ITF, our our normal operating procedure is to submit them. On, on a non assert basis, meaning in an open source friendly way, so that people who develop open source software and they want to implement those RFCs, they are free to do that. They don't even have to talk to us. Okay, they can just go ahead and implement. It, okay, so I think I think the, the, the space in terms of the transport specific transport standards and video coding standards, it's it's very well understood and, 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 and open. Now again, this doesn't mean you can go and duplicate what video is doing. And, and, and not infringe our patents. That's absolutely not the case. Okay, uh, uh, and a lot of what again I described is covered. And in fact, uh, probably you know my my guess, and this is only guess, you know, Simulcast is maybe in a, a way for people to to try to do what SVC is doing, but without you know truly using SVC. Um, uh, but again, the codec is is licensable, right? And people are probably familiar with the. You know the WebRTC thing. I don't want to go there now, but but you know the whole issue about VP8 versus H.264 for, for WebRTC, right? And the licensing issues. But it's understood, and for the transport, it's open source friendly already. So so people are free to 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 go ahead and implement uh, all the specs. Okay, so in summary, what we're saying is that uh, it is licensable, but if you want to develop some kind of open source, uh, you can do so. It's only when you go into commercial rollout and you start making money, big chunks of money from it, that uh, you're going to um, be walloped. As usual, and again, people who have been in companies know that uh, that you know uh, that's true no matter what. Uh, in other words, there are people who, as soon as a company becomes large, they'll, they'll come after you regardless if their claims have merit or not. But uh, you know, trolls and what have you. But uh, yes, so so again, for SVC in particular, uh, yes. But let me point out that, for example, VP8 has temporal scalability. So so you know, one could use right. Potentially, right? And again, I'm not. I, I, I want to make any claims about if VP8 infringes on patents, etc. No. So, so as a disclosure, this is not. You know, it's not a legal opinion. You know, I'm not a. I'm not a licensed attorney. Okay, I'm not expressing a legal opinion. But so VP8 is out there and has temporal scalability. So if you are, if you want to do a project, maybe you can choose that. You know, versus something else. I'm just, you know, I'm just speculating here. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, very quick question before I forget it. Where do you sit, Alex, on the big debate between VP8 and H.264 in uh, WebRTC? Which side? Guys, you it doesn't think? matter. Look, look I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It doesn't matter. The important thing with WebRTC is the API. People learning how to program video and audio in their applications. In my opinion, in my opinion, the engine should be replaceable. If I want to pay more. And get better quality, I should be able to do that with the same API. So the developer shouldn't have to deal with the engine, right? Uh, so you do, shouldn't be a rocket scientist, right, uh, to, to, to drive an airplane, right? You need to know how to drive it, but you don't need to, to make the, the engine. So, in my opinion, in practice, right, in practice, in reality, what is most likely to happen is we'll get a huge benefit of programmability, meaning people learning to program a, an API that's understood by everybody. And in practice, what you'll have is implementations of that API that underneath have engines that have different features. Now, it's an oversimplification. It's an oversimplification to think that just because you selected the codec, you are done. I hope today I convinced you that there is so much exchange of information between an endpoint and the server, right, that selecting the codec is just one decision you have to make. 
right? There's tons of stuff that has to go back and forth, like send me that layer or that, you know, the other layer or this is my bitrate estimate, etc. Where is all that? Without it, you have very poor quality experience. And that's why what happens with MRTC today is this. People get excited, they write an application, it doesn't take long, they are happy because they can see video, and then when they, when they want to see high quality video, there's nowhere to go. Because unfortunately, again, without having taken care of the dynamics between the server and the endpoint, and this is not covered by today's standards, you're not gonna get the quality that you would get from video or from you know what you get right now. So, so that's why I think, you know, in my opinion, uh, you know, obviously we, 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 we have both H264 products, we have EPA products, <coughs> uh, but I think in the end, in the end it does matter. That's not the biggest benefit of, uh, of uh, WebRTC. But doesn't it matter though, um, when you have something like the video router in the middle, and then you have how the browser is supporting one codec and like SVC and the others that support VP8 SVC, and then how would something like the video router handle that? Doesn't it matter to have at least something that they can converge on? But look, in, in the end, look, evolution, evolution always brings the new guy, and the new guy needs to bring change. So, so that's why when I say the death of the MCU, I'm sort of exaggerating in what sense. We will always need some sort of a gateway, right? Uh, because there will always be people with older stuff, and there will always be people with new stuff, right? So, so, so we're never going to be in a world with a single video coding standard, and everybody agrees on, and all the interactions work in exactly the same way. I think that, you know, that, would be, that would be the ideal, maybe, but I think, you know, I'm not even sure it would be the ideal, honestly, because, again, progress means means change. Change means uh, things will be done differently. Ergo, I need something to adapt between the old and and, and, uh, and the new. Now, the, the, in my mind, uh, look, the, the, with whoever you see, the key thing is the no download. When a software device, right, for example, for myself today, did I care what video codec I'm using? No. If I didn't have it on my browser, it would be downloaded and it would be, it would be running. Why did I care, right? Did I care if it was preloaded or downloaded? So there are very specific use cases where you cannot do an install, right, on the on the browser. Now for them, I, I agree it's important to be able to run with a no install solution. Uh, but maybe you know the standard WebRTC, whatever you know, will be what people use if they don't care about quality and they don't want to pay. But people who want high quality and are willing to pay will use something else. Um, you mentioned WebRTC several times, and please, if there's someone else that wants to ask questions, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and uh, you mentioned how important the API is, and you probably know that Bernard is um, very much involved in uh, the definition of the uh, ORTC API. Where do you stand on that WebRTC versus ORTC? Do you have an opinion there? Uh, frankly, I don't. And uh, uh, you know, we do work with uh, Google on the design from the VP9 side. And so that's where our current uh, current focus is. Okay, Alex, how much time do you have? Do you have a few more minutes? You have a couple of more questions, if possible. But okay, a few more minutes is fine. Yes. Okay, so that lets Carl out. No, I'm just kidding. Let me uh, try to get um, Michael Elling in here. Uh, Michael, can you hear me? And can we hear you? More importantly. Oops, what happened? He got muted again. Okay, so um, hi Alex. Uh, uh, question uh, regarding the video router: Is it is it um, can it be distributed? And the reason I ask that is if we want to start scaling uh, video conferencing and and say you have uh, uh, three people in Boston and two p you know five people in Seattle and and three people in uh, in LA. Where where is it most efficient to be um, uh, processing all those uh, streams from? Uh, oh, yeah. is, is, is that a smart question? No, it's, a, it's a, it's an excellent question and because of the low delay of the video router it's practical to have it cascaded. So in fact it's, it, was, it was supported very early on cascading, I mean, and you can actually have very sophisticated cascading configurations uh, so that you can deploy you know, you can deploy devices uh, either locally in the same closet if you want to scale up to support, you know, thousands of users from the same rack, or you can deploy in geographically distinct locations, right? And you can have, you know, one one in Europe, you know, one in Japan, one in uh, one in the U.S. And by the way, one of the 
good things about this technology is that <coughs> licenses are software licenses, meaning you can actually float them around the globe. So if you have a license in, 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 in the U.S., when you are asleep in the U.S., the same license can be used in Japan, and they can actually, you know, it, it goes from the same pool. So you can actually have three routers sharing licenses, port licenses, and, and you know, and because of the geographical dispersion, you need fewer licenses to cover people globally. Okay, because some people hopefully are asleep when the others are are, are working. Cool. So okay, that, thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Michael, and I will um, get you the intro email. So now a little uh, recurrent feature. This is the end. Alex, we'll uh, let you go in just a moment, but first. And now here's one final question from Carl Fife. Although the words one and final are not contractual, so here's Carl Fife with his series of questions and sub-questions that may or may not be possible to answer. Take it away, Carl. Thanks, Allison, and, and thanks for the beer. I appreciate that. Um, I'll be right out. Um, so, uh, my, my question is, uh, is a, a, a simple one. Uh, I noticed that when attempting video from mobile devices, the quality is always uh, extremely limited. And I understand that the limiting resource there is, um, uh, you know, basically uh, video compression on a mobile device with limited power and, and you know, maybe limited CPU uh, resources, maybe only as it relates to power consumption. But you, you know, what is it going to take, or how long are, how far are we away from, uh, from, from, from mobile video that doesn't, um, what's the word, uh, suck? That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> you know, because of that, because of that, that issue where you can't, you know, I mean, if you were to apply the kind of software video compression required for good quality mobile video, you'd need, you know, you'd need a, you know, a Tesla. Roadster size battery to you know to keep that sucker running. So um, so that's my question. I mean, is it going to be something like is it, is it, do we need ASICs? Do we need you know are there instructions that are making their way to to processors or are people going to include a, you know uh, you no, know a, a hardware encoder? Excuse me, Carl. I think um, I think he was muted for a second. Alex, can we hear you? Yes, 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 I'm okay. here. So, look, the, 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 the reality is that, you know, the quality on the mobile will always be worse than the, on the desktop, okay? Uh, the quality of my mobile today is much better than it was, you know, 10 years ago, right, on my mobile, uh, and mm -hmm. on, even on mm -hmm. my desktop, right? So, so it's an unfair comparison always because we have, the, you know, we have much better cameras. The optics of the camera and the resolution is much better on the desktop than it used to be. It's getting better on the mobile as well. Something people don't appreciate is that oftentimes the hardware that is available on, the, on, a, on a device like, the, like an iPhone may not be available for, for, uh, for, for people who do interactive uh, video, meaning the, the API on the hardware may not be uh, available. Now, for the encoding part, if you do it on the general processor of the, of the device, right, uh, that's draining the battery. You cannot do a very good encode yeah. because you don't have a lot of cycles yeah. to do all the complicated calculations that encoding needs to do. So you don't use your bits sure. efficiently, and also the connection is not very is not very efficient. I think I think you know things will obviously improve. I cannot tell you when it will be as good as you know like a 500 kilobit on a desktop. Um, it really depends on how this you know the chips are are are, are evolving. But I think the more and more people use these devices for video, and I think now we're at a position where you can do that, meaning you can actually connect, meaningfully connect, on a conference, or maybe not on an iPhone, on an iPhone too, and an iPad, and participate and get work done. Now, because of that, with more people joining in video conferencing, the manufacturers will pay more and more attention to this feature. So you'll be able to use more and more hardware on this device for video conferencing, because again, as I said, the video capability on the iPhone is not designed for your video conferencing needs. It's really designed for you to go to iTunes, right. download movies, and watch them. I mean, that's really the the primary use of or, the video. Or, or it's, or, I mean, the video quality is is phenomenal, but only if it's not being aggressively compressed, right? In other words, you can right. shoot 1080p video and it looks Correct. like gangbusters. Yeah. But yes. but uh, but like like there's this conversation between VP8 and H.264, and so I'm thinking about well I don't know enough about the details of uh, VP8, but my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, the my understanding about H.264 is that it's 
optimized for you know whatever integer math, which is associate, which is optimized for you know hardware compression, ASICs, and things like that. So so is the future of mobile video um, because because of course like when you do vo mobile video on you know on over Wi-Fi on a really really you know uh, you know high quality uplink, it still is terrible. And we of course to me and I. I Carl, we were just doing this today. Yeah. I was testing with James. I know Alex is going to have to go, and I'm going to say, mm -hmm. let's do this in part two because I forced a part two on these guys. Uh, it's a great <laughs> subject, but uh, you know what? Mobile does suck. Um, the Nexus 5 may not be powerful enough. I don't know what the most powerful mobile phone is today. Alex, do you know what what would be the best phone but that, to that's use? Kind of the, that's kind of the question, right? Is it, is it, a, is it an ASIC thing? Or I mean, like, it, what is is the, I mean, it, it obviously comes down to video compression. So, is, yeah. the, is the future going to be about ASICs, or and and if it is about ASICs, is there is it, is that going to dictate whether H.264 becomes the de facto standard, or whether VP8 becomes a de facto standard, or you know what I'm saying? It's an important question because I think the hardware is a big deal, and this is yes. why this is where we're falling short today, anyway. Yeah, hardware is, is is a big deal. I6 is a key for low battery consumption. There is no doubt about it, but Guys, something else we should not forget. For, for interactive video conferencing, the interaction between the software and the chip is very tight. If you just mm -hmm. press to record or for playback, it does have to be very tight. You can have a single function call and say, you know, compress, and then it will give you back the compressed data, and you're done, right? It doesn't work like that for, for video conferencing. So, so for better or for worse, the interaction between the designers of the software and the designers of the hardware on the on the phone or the portable device has to be really very very tight for this to work. If it, if it's not there, mm -hmm. you might as well not even use the hardware. So you have it and you're not using. It. Right. Okay. I see. Okay. Again, I pretty maybe, sure maybe we can talk more about that in part two because I because you know right, consistent with Allison's uh, <laughs> comment, I, I have a series of questions and follow up questions that may or may not be possible to answer. <laughs> Okay, but we should probably let Alex go. I'm pretty sure we've kept him for over an hour. Alex, thank you very, very much, and I do hope you'll come back, and hopefully Bernard will be with us at that point. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, thank Emil. You. And uh, before I start thanking lists and lists of people, let me just cut off this broadcast so it isn't too long. We will see you all soon. In the meantime, we've got the mature audiences only coming up as soon as I click this button.